I didn't get here alone. There's so many women throughout this century that have gone before me and have, have taken to the skies. The Mercury women from back in the early 1960s. All these women have been my role models and my inspiration. And I couldn't be here today without them. And I'd like to say a special thank you to them. When Eileen Collins became the first American woman to pilot a space shuttle in 1995, she invited 13 women to her launch. These women passed the Project Mercury astronaut tests and broke barriers. So why weren't they allowed to become astronauts at NASA? On October 4, 1957, the Soviet Union launched a satellite named Sputnik. The United States and USSR competed in an aggressive space race to send satellites, animals, and humans into uncharted territory. In 1959, NASA announced Project Mercury to send American men into space. As NASA tested the Project Mercury candidates for spaceflight, two of the men who designed the rigorous astronaut tests, Dr. Flickinger and Lovelace II, wondered how women would perform in space. Due to their lower weight, water, food, and oxygen consumption, would women be better suited for spaceflight than men? As a scientific experiment, Drs. Flickinger and Lovelace began a privately funded program, not sponsored by NASA, to test women's capabilities for spaceflight. These women were nicknamed the Mercury 13 and broke gender and perception barriers. In a world where, if you look at the jobs for women in the newspaper, it's teacher, nurse, secretary, and certainly not astronaut. In February of 1960, Jerry Kopp, one of the most accomplished aviators of the time, was recruited to be the first woman to complete the same three phases of physical, psychological, and spaceflight tests as her male counterparts in the Project Mercury program. When Kopp exceeded expectation and passed all three phases, performing in the top 2% of all male astronaut candidates, Dr. Lovelace announced her results at a space convention in August of 1960. Out of the 19 women invited to participate in the study, 13 passed. During World War II, there was a group of women aviators called the Women's Army Service Pilots, WASP for short, and they were probably the most groundbreaking women's pilots there were. They were an auxiliary of the Army Air Force at the time, and they went through the same basic training that the men pilots went through, but they weren't allowed to fly in combat. Some of the Mercury 13 were wasps and occupied what was considered men's jobs so that men could fight in the war. With safety records comparable to male pilots, female pilots proved that women and men were equally capable of flying military airplanes. As World War II ended, the WASP organization was disbanded. The men returned and reclaimed the piloting jobs. In the 1950s and 60s, men held a majority of jobs in aviation. The Mercury 13 were members of a women's flight organization called the 99s. These women pursued recreational flying and some became flight instructors or hired by aircraft companies. So a lot of these women pilots used to apply with a resume that only had their initials, not their first name and their last name. And then they would hope that when they showed up for the interview that the person on the other side of the desk would have been impressed enough with the uh, credentials and with their experience that they would be willing essentially to overlook the fact that they were a woman. These women broke barriers in aviation to prove that women and men were equally capable of flying airplanes. The next step was to justify that women and men were equally capable of space flight. These were women who wanted to fly the next fastest thing. These were women who were pilots, first and foremost. And so space was the next fastest thing going, and they wanted to be a part of that. Early in 1961, 18 more female pilots, each with over 1,500 flight hours, underwent the first phase of testing at the Loveless Medical Clinic in Albuquerque, New Mexico. It lasted one week and there were 87 intensive tests. And they did everything there was possibly to do on a person. The testing was all a surprise. You didn't know what to expect. The women swallowed three foot rubber hoses to measure stomach juices, had their inner ears frozen with 10 degree water to induce vertigo, and had electrodes attached to their bodies to measure oxygen usage and lung capacity while they rode bicycles to exhaustion. 13 women passed phase one, that's 68% of the women compared to only 56% of the men. They just said, you beat the Mercury 
27. In passing one of the toughest medical examinations in history, the Mercury 13 women broke the perception that females were fragile and weak. Women had uh, proven that physically they could go into space. Phase 2 entailed three days of additional psychological tests, which involved a sensory deprivation tank that was eight feet deep in a dark, soundproof, odorless room. The woman floated on top of the water while all five senses were completely removed. In 1961, the tolerance record was six hours for surviving sensory deprivation before hallucinations began. The Mercury woman who took the test shattered this record, lasting over 10 hours before termination by the staff. Psychologists say women would definitely be much uh, more able to withstand the isolation and the boredom of a flight like this than men can. Phase 3 was slated to take place in July of 1961 at the U.S. Naval School of Aviation Medicine in Pensacola, Florida. It would last 10 days of physical training, escapes from submerged cockpits, and jet piloting. When Jerry Cobb completed this phase back in 1960, her scores were equivalent to skilled Navy pilots. However, six days before the remaining 12 women would undergo Phase 3. The Navy pulled the rug out from underneath them. The Lovelace testing gets canceled because there is nervousness in the government, that being the Pentagon, the White House, and NASA, that being seen as taking women's testing seriously will make the whole program look frivolous. Jerry Cobb and Janie Hart arranged a meeting with Vice President Johnson in March of 1962. Cobb explained from a scientific standpoint how the results of the testing proved that women should be astronauts at NASA. After the meeting, Johnson wrote a letter to James Webb, the head of NASA, about the Women in Space program in which he wrote, let's stop this now across the paper. They were afraid that the women's story would be a distraction. Johnson downed our program. That was tough on me, but I cared. Tests I knew were very important and they would help the next generation. In July of 1962, Jerry Cobb and Janie Hart testified before the House of Representatives Subcommittee on the Selection of Astronauts to determine if NASA's criteria for selecting astronauts discriminated against women. They were hoping to convince Congress to pressure NASA to accept them, but it didn't happen. NASA testified that women were not qualified to be astronauts because they were not military jet test pilots. However, women were barred from becoming jet test pilots because they weren't allowed to attend Air Force training schools. When Dwight Eisenhower makes a decision that astronauts are going to be drawn from the ranks of military trained jet test pilots, that in some ways really bakes in maleness into the job description because there are no women who can meet that standard. Men in Power created the barriers that prevented the Mercury 13 women from spaceflight. Let me sum it up with John Glenn's commentary. He stated, the men go off and fight the wars and fly the airplanes and help design and build and test them. The fact that women are not in this field is a fact of our social order. So when I applied to NASA three times, they said, Wally, you do not have an engineering degree. And so I went to one of the colleges there and I said, I need to come in and get an engineering degree. They said, oh, you're a girl, go to home ec. Jerry Cobb and Janie Hart asserted that women should have the same education and jet pilot opportunities as men since their astronaut tests proved that they were capable. However, on the third day, Congress canceled the hearing. They also didn't want to have a female astronaut back then. Though the Mercury 13 didn't become astronauts in the end, they broke gender and perception barriers, and their efforts enabled future generations of American women to be pilots and astronauts. When Eileen Collins became America's first female space shuttle pilot, she invited the Mercury 13 women to her launch. And I couldn't be here today without them. And she was so disappointed that they wouldn't take me that she took my pin up. The Mercury 13 were trailblazing women who fought fearlessly for gender equality in the aviation and aerospace industries. Janie Hart later co-founded the National Organization for Women, which is currently the largest women's rights organization in the U.S. Indeed, these courageous women were ahead of their time. One thing that you need to know is what my mother told me. Don't go faster than your angel can fly. Sixty years after her astronaut testing, Wally Funk will go to space. This year, she will take a Virgin Galactic flight and break John Glenn's record as the oldest astronaut in space. It'll take off from New Mexico and it'll go into space and it'll come back.